All right, hello, here we are uh, again, session 10 in the summer uh, session. Uh, accepting discipline, uh, primarily in chapter 29 is what we're gonna be looking at uh, today, uh, verses one to three and then 12 to 20. So let's kind of take a look at that thing. And the idea, God uses discipline from society, from our families, and from other places to shape his people. And so we're going to kind of look at the idea of being shaped by his discipline or in his wisdom as we look at that idea. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you've blessed us. We thank you for opening up the word of God to us. We pray this to be all about you, not about us. Help us to see the truth we have here. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, whenever the topic of discipline comes up, uh, people usually give a, a variety of reactions to it. And, uh, and most people <clears throat> don't, uh, I guess would say, would have unpleasant thoughts when, when you bring the word up, discipline. You ask, well, why is that? And because most of us see it as drudgery, most of us see it as something we don't want to experience and so forth, and so we don't like that idea of discipline. But when you look at it, few things happen of any fruitful meaning if it doesn't have discipline with it. And what I mean by that is the athlete must discipline himself in training. The scientist must discipline himself in study and research and so forth. The theologian, the businessman, uh, all must discipline themselves to stay focused if they are to succeed. And that's the idea behind that idea of discipline. You must keep training your mind and your body. And that's the idea behind discipline to succeed. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Discipline is not new to our age. This is not something new that's come up in the last 30, 40, 50 years. But this has been around for a long time, this idea of discipline yourself, your mind, and your body. And Paul talked about it a lot, too, in all of his writings. The, Abraham Lincoln said this about discipline. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. There is a difference there, isn't it? What you want now and what you want most. All right? And the idea then John Wooden, a famous basketball coach back in the 60s at UCLA, said this, discipline yourself and others won't need to. And John Maxwell, uh, a author, speaker, and pastor, who primarily wrote a lot of books on leadership, he said this, small disciplines repeated with consistency every day lead to great achievements gained slowly over time. It's that ability or it's that desire to put in the time daily to discipline ourselves. Uh, we want to have a great knowledge of the Word of God. Uh, we're going to need to spend time daily ingesting the Word of God, taking it in and developing that. And the first week, we won't have a great knowledge of what the Word of God says, but after years of reading and studying on a daily consistent basis, we will start to realize we have gathered so much knowledge from it. There's still so much more to gain, but we will see the difference there. And it's that slow, consistent process of what Maxwell was talking about. Well, our spiritual journeys as believers follow that similar path. Uh, faith in Jesus Christ gives us new life. We can see that. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. We have that new life. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. But it does not automatically make us a mature believer. And that's what discipline is for. To become a mature believer, that takes discipline. In the same way, we believers should welcome God's discipline for the purposes of our holiness. He's not doing this. Uh, he's doing it for our own good and develop holiness in us. And so we accept that to help us get back on the right track. And so we can discipline ourselves or God will have to discipline us. But anyhow, the idea is to get us onto the right track. And so that's what we're going to look at today. This section of Proverbs, this last, this is, is the last major section that involves Solomon. Uh, someone else attributes the, the last, the ending chapters. But this section here, and it starts out in verse 25, 1, this section, all the way through 29, 27, this section. And uh, it was actually compi uh, compiled by Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, long after Solomon had passed away, and it, it compiled some of his Proverbs and put them with the rest of the Proverbs there. And it, it, we see that in verse 25, verse 1. These are more Proverbs of Solomon collected by the advisors of King Hezekiah in Judah, of Judah. So as we read this section, uh, I, I want you to I encourage you to, to look at the theme in these sections. You'll see two 
themes that kind of arise out of this. One, it's appeal to trust God in everything else in life. Trust God, put our trust in our, our life in God's hands. And the other thing we'll see is involves choosing the right path of righteousness and avoiding the path of evil. So we want to choose the right path of righteousness and avoid the path of evil, and we want to place our life into God's hands. And that's the two major themes you're going to see in this section if you read chapters 25 through 29. So today we're going to look at accepting discipline, and the first thing we're going to look at in 29, 1 to 3 is the goal. What is the goal of accepting discipline? And we're going to see that here in 29, 1 to 3, and it says here in those verses, one who becomes stick necked after many reprimands will be shattered instantly beyond recovery. When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father. And so we see that beautiful uh, setup here. Brings joy to his father. Oops, sorry. Anyhow, we see that as we look at that, the idea of the difficulty in discipline comes when we become stiff-necked. And, and, or I think as, as a New Living Translation puts it, who stubbornly refuses to accept criticism. And, that, and that, I think that kind of spells out what we're, what we're looking at. The imagery here is of a mule that um, has a bridle on, in, on and a bit in his mouth, and he refuses to go the way the rider is trying to guide him. He wants to turn him to the left or turn him to the right, and so he pulls on the reins one side and the bit pulls, tries to pull his head that direction so he'll naturally follow, but he stiffens his neck up not to, you know, I'm not going to go. And so that's the idea that, that's here, that's, that's the imagery here. It stiffens the neck and, and, and pulls in a, in a different direction. Well, likewise, a stubborn person who refuses God's reprimands, or as, as the CBS says, as opportunities to be submissive, uh, or to change his character, and that's what is, is, is being looked at here. I'm sorry, these pages will not separate. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, likewise, it says here, that we, we, we avoid those reprimands. God works patiently, he says here, and we see that because he says many reprimands uh, will be, sh he, if after many reprimands, he'll be shattered. Well, see the idea that God, right, is lovingly work with his people so they will be a, uh, will yield to him. The point here is that his effort he's putting in is a loving correction. He's trying over time. But Solomon gives us a warning here when he sees this. He says eventually what happens? The Lord has to step in and the results are the consequences that we suffer. You know, there comes a point when even if we repent and are forgiven, we still must suffer the consequences if we continue going down a path. It may take that effort to get us to stop. As King uh, David uh, dealt with the, the loss of his son in his sin with Bathsheba, it came to the point where he still suffered the consequences. Even though he was forgiven, he still suffered those consequences and he repented. And so we see that, that idea there. All right, uh, God's working patiently. As Solomon gives us a warning, we see in verse 1 the impact of being stubbornly refusing God's discipline. In verse 2, we see the impact of a righteous leader on the morale of the people. And it says here, when the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. And we see that, that beautiful picture here. Uh, Solomon's pointing out, when righteous triumph, there's great rejoicing. But when the wicked come to power, people hide. That's how the CBS the, uh, the Christian Standard Bible puts it uh, the Christi uh, in Proverbs 29, uh, 28, 12. What a beautiful picture that is. When righteous trump, the people are rejoicing, but when they, wicked come to power, people hide. God's people can enjoy life when righteousness uh, is predominant in the government. There's rejoicing, but when people always suffer when wickedness, and when wicked uh, come under wicked regi regime, regimes, excuse me, in verse 2, we see the effect of, uh, of the righteous on morale. In verse 3, we see the effect on, on the wisdom in the family. A man who loves, right? A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father. But the one who consorts with prostitutes destroys his wealth. And so we see that idea there, the one who accepts God's wisdom here. What's happening here is the one who accepts discipline becomes wise. As you accept God's discipline and you apply it to your life, you become wise and it helps you in making further future decisions as you go down that line. This idea here is brings joy to the parents, right? Uh, 
in contrast to the unwise who, uh, who uh, spends their money foolishly. And so the idea here is bringing joy to the parents seeing a child using the wisdom that they've gained and, and making decisions in life as they move forward. So not only would we have the goal of accepting wisdom, what is our goal? To accept wisdom and to apply it to our life, we also see the thing that it's available. Wisdom is available and it's available to all. We see this in verses 12 to 13, and we're gonna jump down to 12 and 13. If a ruler listens to lies, his officials will be wicked. The poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. A king who judges the poor with fairness his throne will be established forever, ever, excuse me. <laughs> we see that government leaders uh, have the power to influence others. That's important for us to look at. They have the power to influence others in how they reign. But a ruler can't govern alone. Anybody who, who, who understands anything about government realizes that even in our United States, the president needs many advisors. Uh, he has to have that to, to guide and direct him because it's too big to manage all by yourself. Any government job, any ruling, any government it's like is that way. The job, so they need advisors. So what does this first warn us about? And it says a ruler, because of his authority, must not listen to lies and deceit. That's what it's telling us there. If a ruler listens to lies and his officials will be wicked. Now what happens when he listens to lies and deceit and he takes that information in? He needs to make sure he guards against that. And the reason is because his advisors, if they see this is what he wants to hear, they will start tailoring their information that direction. That's how they normally do it, because they want to please whoever they're ministering with or to. Uh, and back in the ancient culture, you didn't want to displease the king. It could result in, in uh, something serious happen. And so they would give advice that they thought the king wanted to hear. And it might necessarily be the truth, or it might be deceit. And so basically, Solomon is telling him, don't listen to that, all right? Be one who demands to hear the truth and don't, not to be deceived, all right? Because what happens is when you, a, a ruler listens to lies and deceit, it eventually corrupts his whole government because his officials start working that direction to please him in that aspect. So they want to make sure that the king makes sure if you're in a ruling position, you want to hear the truth. Solomon points out that God gives light to all there in that, in that next verse. He says the, the poor uh, and the oppressor have this in common. Even the king and the poor have the same thing in common. They need God's light. That's, in, that's important. God, he points this out. It's a, we have a common heritage. We need to have light from the Lord uh, and to guide us in making our decisions. And so the king both needs that and so do the poor. Everyone needs that idea of having light into their life. So where can we find God's light? When it's this thing, it's available to us, where do we find it? Well, it can be found in his word, and, that's, uh, and we all know this. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. And here we have that image of the word of God being a light to guide us down the path of life. We're walking down this pipe to stay on the path, not to veer off the path, and we stay, and we do that by staying in the word of God. Then the last thing here in this section, in verse 14, we see the treatment of the poor. We see how that's it. A king who judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. And here we have the, the, the we see the treatment of the poor during any administration, all right, depends on its moral character of its leaders. In other words, we see a king who judges fairly will, uh, fairly will gain favor with his subjects. A leader, a leader who listens uh, to God's discipline will lead in fairness, all right? And that's important, and it'll, it'll come up in two, two areas. One, it will develop loyalty in the majority of his king's subjects. If he's fair, this will, will bring loyalty from the king's subjects because he's fair, and, they'll, and they like that. And two, God's also promised that he will secure the king's rule and authority by being a fair, by being a fair judge because he does more than just rule. He does administrators, judging, and, us, and so forth. And so God will uh, secure the king's role and his authority. We see that God's wisdom is available to all who seek it. And James tells us that in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. If you seek wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but, you will, but when you ask him, be sure your faith is 
is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave on the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. That's what we need to do. We need to look for that wisdom. Go to God and ask him for it. And so we see the idea that we can accept it. Is it there for us, this idea of this wisdom? The purpose of God's wisdom, as we see in this section, is to guide us back to his word where we may find wisdom in how to live a righteous life. That's what finding wisdom is all about. But the next section we want to look at now is the responsibility. We have a responsibility toward accepting this wisdom, and we see this in verses 15 to 17. Erotic correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. When the wicked increase, rebellion increases, but the righteous will seek, will, excuse me, will see their downfall. Discipline your child, and it, it will be willing, excuse me, and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. Excuse me. The idea is we have the responsibility, right, to discipline our children. And God, we need to accept this discipline. We need the responsibility to accept our own discipline and then to discipline others or our children. All right? When we see here this idea of uh, the youth, the word youth can refer to any uh, child of any age all the way up from infancy to young adult. And so we see uh, this whole idea of correcting youth happens throughout their, their growing period, especially as they're young. Uh, what is the warning that we see with a child left without discipline or correction? If you leave a child without correction, what is the warning we see here? And it says here, but a youth left to himself is a disgrace to his mother. I, and generally this means to the parents, right? And you ask how? Well, because of foolish pursuits, all right? They will, fool, they will foolishly pursue things uh, and not be corrected on. And we see the results of this on our streets today. We see this, the, what's happening out there, that people are uh, going after foolish pursuits. Well, Solomon warns us to discipline our children, but it has to be done with the aim of correction. That's how Solomon's been telling us all along. That's how you, and how you do it. You want to discipline your children with the aim of correcting them, not beating them for punishment, but correcting them, guiding them back onto the path. And this is what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. In other words, show them from the Word of God the discipline or the direction they need to go and correction. Discipline is always is aimed at correcting behavior and drawing us back onto the path, drawing us closer to God down that path. In verse 16 then, we see when the wicked increase, rebellion increases, but the righteous will see their downfall. When society as a whole rejects God, it has a negative impact on society. We can see that uh, happening today. And rebellion is what you get. Uh, we see that today. We have, we have a whole, whole uh, genre, a whole mess of young people who are out there marching in Tifa that have no idea what they're marching for, but they're in rebellion. And we see that happening. And what it is is some, uh, a bunch of children have grown up with lack of discipline in their life. But where evil flourishes, it will eventually implode. And we'll see this. This will eventually implode on itself, this evil. Uh, and the righteous will see it its downfall someday. Uh, keep in mind, it may not happen immediately, but it will happen. And, it, and, the, and when the Lord was speaking in, in, in due course, God will judge the wicked and punish their sin. And we see this in Matthew 24. 48 and he's talking about separating the sheep and the goats in, in, in that section and when they go and they being the goats will go away into internal punishment but the righteous into eternal life and this is what he's talking about he will eventually punish those and that will happen and so we see that and so basically if evil flourishes it eventually will implode on itself in verse 17 then we see when parents put in the work to impart godly attitudes and actions into their children, they gain peace of mind and delight in seeing their children follow after God. That's what we see in verse 17. It says, discipline your child and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. And so that's the idea there. It will bring us that idea of pleasure knowing that our child is following after God on his own and God is working in his life and teaching him and instructing him from the word of God. Well, we see lastly here now, 
What is the source of this wisdom? And we, we touch on this a little bit, but we're going to go back and look at it, the source of this wisdom as we find in verses 18 to 20. Without reservation, people run, without revelation, excuse me, people run wild, but one who follows divine instruction will be happy. A servant cannot be disciplined by words, though he understands he doesn't respond. Do you see someone who speaks too soon? There is more hope for a fool than for him. What is the source of this wisdom? Well, Solomon gives us the source of God's discipline found in verse 18 when he says res- rev- revelation. The prophets gave them revelation. If they ignored those, those revelations, that was God's word coming to them. Then eventually discipline had to come to correct them, to bring them back to the path where they, they listened to that revelation that was coming. And so we find it in God's word. All right? Our compliance with God word, God's word is an individual choice. Now, we can choose to comply with it or we can choose not to. But Solomon warns that those who don't receive God's word run wild. And that idea means to, be, to, to run wild is to cast off. And so, meaning that the cat people cast off what God uh, says and they resort to with their own desires. Well, you can see the danger in this. They're casting off what God says and, and resort to their own desires. And we see that Judges uh, chapter 21, 25 speaks to that, what was happening in Israel back then and happened the same today. It says, it, it characterizes this idea. It says, in those days, king had no, uh, Israel had no king, right? All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And it almost appears today that in America we see this idea, and America today has no God, right? And all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Instead of accepting God's discipline, they are running wild. And we see this happening in our streets again. This, the contrast here is those who follow God's instruction. Look what it says for those who follow instruction, right? Without revelation, the people run wild, but the one who follows divine instruction will be happy or will be blessed. That's the idea there. Isn't that beautiful? If, if you sit there, if you follow God's word, you will be blessed. And so we, we pray for our country to get back on track and to once again listen to the word of God. All right, we see now in verse 19, the first part of it, Solomon points out that the hearing of God's word is not enough. He says there, a servant cannot be disciplined by words. And what he basically said, a servant can't be disciplined by words. There must be action that goes with it. And, and what I mean by that is, is when he hears a word, it has to have proper application in his life for then discipline then to take root, take hold, and for him to be changed. It reminds me of what James says in verses uh, 1, 22, and also in 25. It says, prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers only who delude themselves. So he hears the word, he hears the instruction, but, he, he, but it, it, James is telling him to be a doer of it. Well, that's what Solomon's here. Be a doer of the instructions that you've received by thereby applying them to your life. And, and thereby making change. And we also follow up with down in verse 25 in the first chapter of James. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And so we see that idea. This is what Solomon's pointing out in this first section. A servant cannot be disciplined by words. Well, let's say he can't be disciplined by words alone. He needs to apply those words in, to action in his life. Though he understands, he did not respond. But the idea that he can hear these words and, and understand them but not respond, but, he, but to understand and to apply them, that's what Solomon is directing us, to be an effectual doer of what you hear and apply it to your life. Solomon gives us some of the sagest advice coming in verse 20. Do you see someone who speaks too soon? Do you see someone who speaks too soon? I like uh, also... I like the way the NLT puts it. Do you see someone who speaks without thinking? Uh, and how often have we caught ourselves doing this? And, and, and it's easy to do. We, we, sometimes we want to make that comment so quickly and we need to stop and filter things through the Word of God and be careful how we speak. Uh, James also speaks of this in chapter 3, verse, verse 8 uh, to, to uh, 10. And he says this, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we bless our God, or excuse me, bless our Father and uh, our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in God's likeness. 
Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Look what, what, what James is saying there. We, sometimes we get rash and we start speaking before we think. And we actually wind up cursing God's creation by, by maligning other people, by saying things that aren't helpful by saying negative things. And so we don't want to do that. We want to think before we speak. We want to think, we want to build one another up. And that's the idea here. We're trying to build each other up. We're trying to encourage one another. And this is what Solomon wants him to do. He wants his sons and so forth to do. He says, don't speak too soon. Measure your words through the word of God. Notice he says there, there is more hope for a fool than for him. Someone who speaks too soon, this happens. But Solomon gives us a warning that's based on, help us, give us the basis for determining, right, action. Actually, what he's doing, he's illuminating what is acceptable to God and what is not by filtering everything through the Word of God. And that's what he's helping us do. So, as we end this lesson, what is your goal? Is your goal to accept wisdom and discipline? That should be your goal. Is it available to you? Yes, it's available to all. It's available to everyone. It can be found in the Word of God. Is it our responsibility to teach others and encourage and build each other up? Yes, that is, our, that is our mission, to encourage, teach others, to reach out to the lost world and build them up and to bring them to Christ. Our source for all this can be found in God's Word. That's where we need to look for it. That's what we need to do. This is uh, basically next week we're going to be looking at something that's, uh, that someone else besides Solomon wrote. This kind of brings the end of Solomon's wisdom. But you can see all through this thing very first from the very, the very, from the very beginning, the beginning of wisdom is in the fear of the Lord. He's carried that thought all the way through, even to this point to there where we see that we need to accept the wisdom that comes from God. We accept it, we grow, we'll be strengthened, and we become more Christ-like. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for how you've blessed us. We thank you how you teach us from the Word of God. Help us to apply today the truths that are in here. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.